Buckle up, everyone. You are strapped in and ready for the Insurance Hour with me, your host, Carl Sussman, the resource to help you navigate the world of insurance. There is a lot of misunderstanding about what insurance is and what insurance isn't. Let me help you demystify insurance and have some fun while we're at it. Informing, educating, and entertaining Californians one policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. Hello, hello. How are you today? This is Carl Sussman with Insurance Hour. Thanks again for joining in. You can always catch me live here at 9 a.m. Or, of course, call in with your questions at 559-656-0317 or email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com. And I love those questions. I've gotten a ton of them. We have so much to talk about today. Uh, it's 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 mind-blowing. So I want to just jump right in. I've been getting a lot of questions uh, about life insurance, which is a little bit different, right? Because typically we've been talking about things like uh, property insurance and car insurance. So it's nice. We're going to switch it up a little bit today and we're going to be talking about life insurance. And I, I have about four emails that came in with questions. We're going to cover those talking about things like um, what type of life insurance there is, cost factors, and of course, the ever best question, what's better, term insurance or permanent insurance? Because after all, that's that's what it comes down to, right? One question, not. So we'll jump right in. After I have my first sip of my morning espresso. Or is it afternoon? I don't know. I'm drinking it all the time, so it doesn't really seem to matter <laughs> if it's morning or, or afternoon. I'm drinking it. All right. So I think before we do anything, let's talk one. Let's get the basic for life insurance. OK, life insurance is one of the it's the one type of insurance that you buy. Uh, oh, actually, uh, we just have a call come in. So much for answering the big questions on life insurance. Let's bring Logan in and see what he's got for us. How are you doing, Logan? Carl here. Hi, Carl. Carl, well, thank you. I had a question about um, uh, earthquake insurance. Uh, I'm a homeowner, and with all these tremors, I've been uh, kind of skeptic as far as, you know, I should probably get earthquake insurance. Uh, now, uh, what would be a good company you would recommend to go with? Yeah, you know, earthquake insurance is one of those things that always, it always surprises me. You, you might be interested to know that um, the lenders cannot mandate that you purchase earthquake insurance, but they can mandate that you purchase fire insurance, which makes sense, right? You should have to protect their collateral by having insurance. But I've always been surprised that they can't mandate earthquake insurance because especially in states like California, where let's face it, we have earthquakes. Actually, in the last couple of weeks, we've had some significant tremors that have been happening. Um, I, there was a, a, three, a 3.5, a 4.0. I mean, just Probably, I would say in the last two weeks, there have been at least five or six earthquakes that are over 3.5. So it's always been a bit of a puzzle to me why people don't purchase uh, earthquake insurance because we have earthquakes. There's no question. I think part of it might be because people are still thinking, you know, old school. They're thinking, oh, I've heard it's expensive or, oh, I've heard the deductibles are big or, oh, I heard there's no choices. So uh, I, I, my, my opinion on earthquake insurance is you, you want to have it if you're in an area where there's earthquakes. And like I said, California is a, is a no brainer to get them. No, oh, great. Great. Uh, uh, I've been looking online for a couple of companies to go with. Uh, is there anyone you would recommend, uh, to, to purchase earthquake? With? Well, yeah, tell, I'm, I'm interested to hear what you're finding searching and, and I'll give you some feedback. What are you finding when you're looking online for options? Well, the main thing I see online is uh, the, the the California Earthquake Authority. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, also, I know it mentions in there that there's maybe a private sector I can look into. Right. Uh, the California Earthquake Authority is, is, is an association that has some money infused from some admitted insurance companies. And they, ha they have what's called more of a mini policy right now. So it's it's fairly limited coverage. Uh, it's it's basically for the structure only. Uh, there are private companies like GeoVera, for example, I know of is is probably the the 800 pound gorilla, um, and they offer a whole slew of different products um, and customizations. You know, coverage for structure, coverage for other structure, coverage for your personal property, coverage for moving out, and all sorts of deductible options. So I think if you're looking um, for flexibility and you're looking for options that's probably going to be the company that has the most options. They even have an option for one big chunk of money. Uh, it's called, I think they call it a single limit, where if, if there's an earthquake, you basically, 
have a pot of money that you dig into and you can utilize that for whatever you need. You don't have to break it down by, well, I need this for personal property. I need this for my cost for moving out. So I think flexibility wise, uh, you're definitely not going to find anyone with more options than GeoVera. Oh, okay, great, great. Now I'll definitely look them up. Okay, terrific. Not a spot, and we're, they're not a sponsor, by the way. I should always say that since I am a licensed broker, I want to be sure everyone knows that GeoVera is not sponsoring this show, even though I've just recommended that they're a, that they're a solid company for choice. Hey, I appreciate the call in. Great, thank you, thank you. You bet. All right. Uh, I always like to say that because I I do write uh, insurance, obviously. And so you might hear me talking about different insurance companies now and then. And obviously, is it a good carrier? Is it a bad carrier? And, and I'll give you my opinion, but I'm not endorsing any particular company over the other. We have another caller that has um, come in. So uh, we'll keep the life insurance questions on pause again. We have Nina. Nina, welcome to Insurance Hour with me, with Carl Sussman. How can I help you today? Hi, Carl. Um, so great to chat. Right, um, sorry. Wanted. Sorry. Wanted to um, ask you a quick question, if I might. I uh, I sure. actually work for a nonprofit, but I know someone who's starting a smaller nonprofit. And uh, do, does a nonprofit need insurance? Does it? You know, what is it? What, what do you That's recommend? a great question. That's a great question. You know, a lot of times, first, everyone likes to talk about nonprofits and there's different versions of nonprofits. I don't know the tax code. There's the 4 the, the 5 this, the 5 that. So I'm not an expert to that extent. But as far as the exposure, having a nonprofit is really no different than having any other type of business. They have the same liabilities. They have the same potential um uh, exposures that are out there for people to potentially have a loss or for some reason decide they're going to sue. So the short answer is absolutely. Nonprofits all need to have insurance just like any other business. The only difference in essence between a nonprofit and a for-profit is, I know it's shocking, one is filing taxes in a certain way to where they're getting closer to zeroing out on profit per se, and the other is is not. But as far as insurance goes, they have the same exposure regardless. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, my, uh, so, you know, I hope this friend goes that way in terms of nonprofits, but uh, we'll see. But actually, I wanted to mention I'm, I'm with the Red Cross, a small, small nonprofit, oh. perhaps you us. That's a, that's, a, that's a heck of a large nonprofit. Absolutely. Great organization. It is. As a matter of fact, I'm uh, I'm in the biomed side, so I do blood drives. And uh, this weekend, I want to do a shameless plug because no one's visiting us these days. I have a drive, a blood drive today, with seriously uh, seven people showing up today. Oh my gosh! Uh, which, yeah, it's really bad. It's really That's, bad. That is really have, bad. Uh, it, well, you know, why don't you do why don't you do this? Give us the web page where people can go if they want to look up where their the local blood drive is. I will tell you one thing that I know about the Red Cross, other than they're they're amazing, and I, I've personally volunteered with them. Uh, that I didn't know about blood drives is that we, I at least, was always under the impression that the major, that if you need blood, right, in the hospital, um, it comes from volunteers somewhere. But I didn't realize, and you can you you work for them, so you probably know better than I do that the vast majority of blood supply in this country comes from donations from people at the, at the Red Cross. Is that, am I, am I on the right path? You're on the, we're about 40%. So yes, we're, wow. we're huge, huge. That's what we do. Wow. And so we're very, we're very blessed and lucky to be able to get donors because donors come to us. We do not pay them. And there's reasons for that. Um, mm -hmm. But basically, people come and they donate, and they donate because it's it's they realize it's their pain. It's forward. Mm -hmm. There are I mean, many of them who who come to join us had a parent, a family member, their their children, their babies. Mm -hmm. need a One out of seven need a transfusion. That's wow. huge. Wow. You know, 40%, life, 40%, yeah. 40% comes from me. Well, I, I thank you so much for your volunteering time. Tell us where can people go if they want to look to see where, if there is a local blood drive that's near them. Oh, I'm so glad you asked, Carl. It's so easy. They just go to uh, redcrossblood.org. And on the right-hand side uh, of that URL page, it'll say, you know, uh, 
sponsor code or put in your zip code. You just put in your zip code. We have them all over the place. This weekend, we have one in Brentwood at, at today. We have one at Brentwood Sunset um, Lux Hotel, which is wonderful. Um, we're there till two today. This weekend, we have Brentwood Presbyterian on Sunday. We have uh, a wonderful place at the Santa Monica Business Park. We are all over the place. And we are so lucky that we get to meet amazing donors and people all over the, the place. So just go to redcrossblood.org, put your zip code in, and we will find the closest location to you every day. We run every day, all the time. Wow. And we'd love your help. Thank you. Yeah, that would be amazing. We'd love people's help. It is the worst we've seen it in over 20 years. And last year, for the first time in 30 years, we had a major hospital closed down for several hours because they had no blood. So this is a unbelievable. Fun, and I'm hoping people can, can, can come out and join us because we need them. We really do. I was going to say, I, you know what? I, I was going to say, you call it a shameless plug. This is not shameless. This is a necessity. So I, I, I appreciate you calling in and giving us that URL. I'll also um, try and put it out there in, in some notes on, on today's program so people can just click on it and go. And hopefully we'll get some more activity out there. Nina, I, I appreciate you calling in. Um, we've got a couple other calls, but we're going to take a quick break. And when yeah. we come back, we'll get on those. Uh, we'll get on the calls that are waiting for me. Thank you so much. It seems like a great show. So I'm, I'm, I'm psyched. This is awesome. This is <laughs> Thank you. Information people need to hear. So thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks, Nina. Be right back. California's insurance market can be challenging, but Sussman Insurance Agency knows the way. Trusted for two generations in home, auto, and personal insurance. Call 877-411-5200 or visit sussmaninsurance.com. Navigate with confidence. Hello, hello. I am back. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. We've had some great callers, callers and we've got another one on hold right now. Let us bring her in. Uh, you are live with Carl with the Insurance Hour. How can I help you this morning? Hi, good morning, Carl. Happy New Year. Same um, to you. I have, thank you. Um, this is maybe kind of a weird question. We have um, several dogs. Um, and over the holidays, we had some friends over and they were kind of jokingly saying, well, I'm surprised you're able, like allowed to have this many dogs in a house, you know, and, and it kind of made us stop and think like, is this a problem with our insurance coverage or anything? And is there an issue with what kind of dogs they are? Um, I mean, they're small, but, um, just curious to know if like there had been a problem with one of them, is that ever an issue with, um, for homeowners coverage? Yeah, the, the, the answer is yes, yes, and good question. Uh, first, I have to ask, because now you've piqued my curiosity, how many dogs are we talking about? <laughs> um, I don't know if I want to say in case my insurance broker is listening. Um, <laughs> we, we, um, we have uh, four. <laughs> oh, big dog, small they're dog. All, they're little. They're all, they're they're little. all okay. small. Like, let, let me, yeah, they're here's, little. here's the thing. Primary, first of all, if you're not, I'm, a, I'm going to go under the auspices that you're not breeding them. They're not for any type of business use, right? These are just, they're just pets or, or part of the family, really. But they're, they're not for and any business, right? Yeah. You're not breeding them and selling puppies or doing anything like that. No, 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 no. Not okay. At all. all right. So here's, here's the situation. Most homeowners insurance policies will come with liability insurance, right? And liability insurance, in, amongst other things, will protect you in the event that uh, well, one of those dogs bites someone. And of course, everyone says, oh, my dog would never do that. My dog's the sweetest pit bull, chihuahua, pit bull, you know, whatever those other breeds are. There's like six or seven that are known to be uh, fairly aggressive, uh, but not mine. And, and the truth mm -hmm. is, being a dog lover like I am, I, I get that because dogs, you can't really paint them all with the same brush, right? Just because of what their breed is, they're going to be aggressive or more likely to bite. I've seen the cutest little dogs that you would ever think, and it's like they're the little bitey, yappy, like they're all, they're all after you. So here's what you need mm -hmm. to know in general about having pets. When you're first purchasing your home insurance, the insurance company is going to ask on the application, do you have dogs, right? And some of them will then yeah, say, yeah. if the answer is yes, they're going to ask what the breed is. And there will be certain breeds that they don't like. Uh, I say pit bulls, Presa Canario, um, 
Uh, I don't have any. There's about six or seven. And what happens is if you have any of those animals, um, it sounds horrible, any of those pets or those breeds of dog, <laughs> then you'll have, depending on the insurance company, one, they'll simply decline to offer you a homeowner's policy. That's the worst case. Uh, the next case might be that they will simply exclude liability from the animals. And most people are OK with that. They say, hey, my dogs don't bite anyway. So fine. Don't cover, you know, exclude coverage for that. Uh, another option is they will put a limit on what they'll pay for animal liability. Right. They might say, well, you're not getting the full mm-hmm. liability limit for, for animal liability. We're just going to give you coverage for a sublimit. Maybe it's ten thousand dollars. Right. You know, in the event that there's some type of, okay. uh, you know, a, a biting accident or injury or something like that happens. And um the most important thing is it's not usually the number of dogs, it's the type of dog, right? So if you have you know, a dog that's on the, the no problem list, typically the carriers are not going to care if you have one or five. Uh, maybe you should get another. But that, it's, it's not typically the quantity <laughs> of, of dogs. It, it's more about uh, what breed the dog is. And some carriers are getting even, even better about it, where they're saying if there's, they're asking if there's a biting history, if there's not then sometimes they'll make an exception, even with some of the dogs that are on uh, some of the more aggressive dog lists, which is nice. And some, I remember, uh, this was back when the market was a little more open than it is today, uh, they were requiring dogs have to go through a particular training class uh, and get a certificate in order to be able to be, uh, you know, the policy to be eligible to to be written. And I thought that was kind of cool, actually, because it was, I think it was a a half a day course that you had to physically take your dog to. And it was, I guess it's like defensive driving for people. This was sort of like a basic dog <laughs> training, you know, thing for, uh, for people to take their pets to. And um, again, that was, that was probably five, six, seven, eight years ago was the last time I saw that was being done. But I think as, as the marketplace starts to open up again, we might, might see a little bit more flexibility with things like that. So the short answer is it's not about the, the number of dogs. It's about the kind of dogs. And as long as, you're letting your insurance broker and the insurance company know what you have. That's the most important thing because that's everyone's biggest mistake, right? They don't tell anybody and then they don't read the fine print in their policy. And then there's a loss and they're like, Oh my God, I didn't know. So always better to just be sure and check with your agent or broker or check with the carrier. Um, You said you didn't want to say, uh, your name because you want your broker to hear. I get it. You can actually call the insurance company and ask them in general. You could say, Hey, I'm looking to get a quote. Um, do you guys have any exclusions for dogs? Right. Uh, you could call your broker okay. and say, Hey, I'm looking to get a policy, uh, with XYZ company. Do they have any issues with dogs? I mean, you could do that. Um, again, keep in mind, you don't want to lie at the end of the day because you're only going to you know, put yourself in a more of a precarious position if there is a loss. Um, but if you're just concerned and you want to find out anonymously, that's okay too. I wonder how I'm I'm not planning on doing this, but I wonder since there's so many like, you know, mutts out there that, you know, are mixed breeds and, you know, minor dogs and stuff. Well, mine are all, you know, they're all mutts, but, you know, I just wonder if like, how do they, do they make you take one of like the doggy 23 and me things? If you're, if, (laughs) you know, the dog may look like one breed, but you know, it's like, well, it's not a purebred. Like I, it doesn't have papers. It could be anything. You right. know, that, that's a great question too. First of all, you know, there is a 23 and me for dogs. You can send a sample. You know, of I know. Your, I just couldn't remember the name. Yeah. I, I, I don't know the name of it, but we've had, we have friends that did it and uh, it, 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 because they, their dog was from a rescue. So the, the, the question really is what if we don't know exactly what it is, right? They didn't all come with papers. It's not yeah. like getting a car where we can check the VIN number and know exactly what it is. And what will happen in that case. And again, this is where you get into the gray a little bit, right? Because you're going to want to represent what you know to be the case, right? I mean, if you look at the dog and you can clearly Mm -hmm. tell it has something in it, then you'll say, you know, it's a mixed breed. I always avoid the term mutt because I think it's derogatory personally. Animal rights, no mutts, they're mixed breeds. And, um, but you know, you're going to need to just have that conversation, right? This is one of the reasons that it's, I always, I say that it's usually better to get a broker or an agent where you can have these conversations rather than just, you know, buying something online because how you check that box is just, it's binary. It's yes or no, right? So what you can do if you're dealing with an agent or a broker, you can say, okay, 
the dog looks like it's a mix of Chihuahua poodle. It's a, ch- a Chapupu. I don't know. Have you ever noticed that <laughs> every dog is mixed breed or mutt <laughs> unless there's poodle in it? Yeah. Then somehow magically it becomes yeah, yeah. a oodle doodle something, right? Oodle, Otherwise, oodle. Yeah, any yeah, other mix is just a mix. So, you know, the, the, the best thing I can advise you to do is use your best judgment, right? And and just be and be honest and transparent. Yeah. Uh, if if the dog appears to be one breed, you know, predominantly, then OK, that's fine. If, you know, if you look at it and you say, huh, you know, this dog clearly is a Chihuahua, right, or, or a German Shepherd or whatever, mm-hmm. then then go with that. Keep in mind, this goes back to my one of my favorite mantras is you never want to give an insurance company a good excuse to not pay a claim. And if it's pretty mm-hmm. darn clear what the what the dog is and you've said something to the contrary, you're you're just looking for trouble, but in, in general, uh, it, that well, what happens is people simply say they don't have a dog. That that's what I see more than anything. It's not usually oh. where they're saying, "Oh, I have a you know." I keep saying poodle. I like poodles. I have a poodle. Where it turns <laughs> out they have a you know a Presta Canario or they've got a, a Doberman or, or something totally different. So again, a little bit of mm-hmm. caution, a lot of honesty and transparency, and that's that's the best the best you can do. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Well, I don't have any of those yucky, not, not that they're yucky, but I don't yucky. have any of the dangerous ones. So okay. they're, they're all gorgeous, but you know, okay. okay. Thank you so much. You bet. Take care. Yep. Um, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Well, we, um, let's, let's get back to the life insurance that we've just barely started and we'll see what we can, what we can get done. I think the most important thing about uh, for us to talk about uh, regarding life insurance is that there is why. It, and like I started saying, that life insurance is the one type of policy that you buy that it's it's not for you, right? I mean, if you buy home insurance, it's because if your home burns down, you want to be sure that your home is rebuilt. If you buy car insurance, it's because you want to be sure if you're in an accident that you're protected and your car can be replaced or you know repaired or whatever the case may be. Health insurance, hello, that's for you. Disability insurance, that's for you. Those are the selfish insurances, I guess you could say. Life insurance is is the one type of insurance that, for the most part, you're purchasing for somebody else. Now, there's exceptions to this, and we can talk a little bit more in detail about living benefits that are called of life insurance policies, and there are some. However, I want you to be aware that for, for the majority of, of why you're purchasing life insurance, it's going to be for somebody or something else, right? That's just the reality of it. So let's go over just a couple of the reasons that you would get life insurance, because I think that's the most, the most fundamental thing other than just, well, if I die, they pay money. Okay. Yeah, that's true. But there's more to it than that. So Think about the first, the most common reason to buy that people will purchase life insurance is to protect their income for their family, right? If something happens and they're the primary or even the secondary breadwinner, hey, if they're working and their income is in some way supporting the household, then life insurance is a great way to be sure that they actually have some money coming in, even when that person is no longer able to generate income because they're no longer with us. So that's probably one of the main reasons people think about life insurance, and it's a completely legitimate reason. Another is is to deal with final expense costs. You know, uh, final expense costs are expensive. Uh, It's not like if if somebody passes away um, mysteriously, all all the work that needs to be done gets paid for. It doesn't. It's, It's not inexpensive. So sometimes people will purchase a small policy, that will cover those final expenses. Uh, other reasons include things like paying off debt. You don't want to leave your family with credit card debt. So there'll be you can buy a policy that'll pay and they can use it for that. You could talk about just building inheritance for your family. You want them to have a higher standard of living than you do. You could want to have it for estate tax purposes. Uh, you could have it for charitable contributions. We had a nonprofit call in earlier. What if you wanted to leave a million dollars to the the American Red Cross. You could do that. All of that's possible. So keep in mind, there are lots and lots of reasons to buy life insurance, all the way down to just the peace of mind that when you're not there, you you assume it's going to be horrible. I know it'd be horrible for everyone I know when I'm gone someday. So let there at least be 
something positive that happens where they can be like, oh God, this is horrible. We don't have Carl anymore. Who will do insurance hour? Oh, look at that. We've got money coming. So that might soften the blow a little bit uh, anyway. So since we've talked a little bit about why we might get life insurance, why don't we talk a little bit about the types of life insurance? And we'll do that as soon as we come back. We'll start out. There's two or three main types of life insurance. We're going to cover each of them, some pros and some cons. And we'll do that in just a moment. Facing the maze of California's insurance market? Let Sussman Insurance Agency be your ally. Expertise in all personal insurance needs for over two generations. Call 877-411-5200 or visit SussmanInsurance.com. Together, we can do this. Hello, hello, and thanks for sticking around and going through that fun little pause without me. Uh, I'm always dancing to the intro music coming back in. I'm not, uh, I guess, only for the people that are watching this on YouTube or, or on the live stream, they get to see that, which is probably for the best. Um, before we jump back into what we were talking about, which is we were going to begin our conversation about different types of life insurance, we've got a call in that I would love to take. Um, so welcome to Insurance Hour with Carl Sussman. How can I help you today? Hi, Carl. How are you? Hi, I'm well. How about yourself? Good, good. I have to say I was a little embarrassed because I was dancing to the intro music and I'm like, wait, am I on FaceTime? <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I had some very, very talented people put together um, all of the little soundtracks that we have. And um, it, it's just kind of catchy. I can't help it, you know. And, and usually yeah, when it runs before it, and after, I'm just kind of doing a little shuffling. But uh, yeah, it's uh, you are not on FaceTime. I can't see you. But thanks for sharing. I don't feel so bad okay. now. No, you shouldn't. So yeah, I have, a, I have a question about life insurance. So I've got insurance for myself. I've got it for my husband. But I have a six-year-old daughter. Should I have life insurance for her? It feels weird and it feels uncomfortable. But it's a, I think it's a valid thought, right? It is. And this is, this is what's funny is when we finish talking, it won't feel weird at all anymore. Here, here's where we all start out, right? And, and I'm a parent. I have two awesome kids. And so for me, the, the idea of buying life insurance, which we all know is you get paid when you die, when uh, if someone else gets paid when you die on your kid is like, yeah, no, no, uh, you know, I'm out. Yeah. There are, but here are the reasons why it actually makes a lot of sense. And it has nothing to do with dying. That's, that's the best part. And we'll get into a little bit of this um, when we talk about the different life insurance products. But the first reason that it makes sense to buy uh, life insurance on, on your kids, and sometimes people will literally do it when they're infants, is for what's called insurability. Now, when we've got our little precious muffins, you know, when they're first born and, and hopefully they're not good where they're healthy and everything is good, you know, life happens, right? Um, they, could, they could develop some type of illness. Uh, they could be involved in a car accident that, that does something to them that makes them uninsurable later in life. And so by purchasing a policy on them when they're young, and it's practically you know impossible to, to not find some option for them, what you're doing is you're guaranteeing that they're always going to have that much coverage available, right? So when they get married someday, if they wanna have coverage, they'll already have it because perhaps at that stage in life, they wouldn't be able to qualify for another policy. So getting to, it's called guaranteeing their insurability. So one of the main reasons to buy life insurance on your on one of your kids, uh, I keep wanting to say offspring, which is such a goofy way to say it because with my two kids, I have a group chat with them and I and I call it offspring. Um, <laughs> so that way, so I keep wanting to say it, and then I'm thinking no one's going to know what I'm talking about. Offspring, like what is that? So the the one of the main reasons to buy life insurance for your for your child is is to guarantee that insurability. Another big one is for savings. And, and that one probably makes a lot of people kind of tilt their head. Well, what do you mean savings? It's life insurance. Well, there are types of life insurance policies that are designed for you to be able to pump a lot of money into, right? Not just the premium that pays for the death benefit, right? We don't want to think about that. You know, it's horrible, but it is a vehicle for savings. People can use that savings for them for college. They can use it as part of their college savings plan. They can use it as part of their, you know, post-graduation, you know, gap year. Uh, although 
I, I don't know about you, but we didn't have gap years when I was graduating from college. I don't know about you, no. but they seem to do that now. So <laughs> it seems like they, there's a need for more money, right? So I, I think that it's important mm-hmm. that, yeah, that you can, you can purchase a policy which ensures their insure, that guarantees their insurability, right? They'll always have at least that amount of coverage. And it can be used as a vehicle to pump a lot of money in that they can take out while they're still alive. You can forget about the death benefit part. That's sort of an extra or call it, it's horrible as a gravy, but it's, it's, it's extra. It's something you don't necessarily want or need, but they will eventually want to have life insurance, right? As they get older and they perhaps mm-hmm. build a family or they, they, they want to have that type of coverage. So you're guaranteeing them to be able to have it. And by doing it when they're that young, you know how life insurance works to the extent that the older you are, the more expensive it is, right? So if you're purchasing a policy mm-hmm. on, a, on a child, someone that's say in the single digits, it's going to be a lot less expensive and a lot easier to obtain than it is when they're in their 20s, 30s, 40s, at some point when they're when they're thinking, oh my God, I've got kids now, I really need to get life insurance. It's going to cost, and it makes sense, right? A lot more for them to have to purchase a policy when they're older than had you purchased a policy when they were younger, you can assign that policy. You can basically sell it to them. And, and I'm not um, I'm not a, an expert on how that the tax ramifications and things like that work or how those transfers are made. But you're I'm, there's there's mechanisms for you to be able to take that policy that you purchased and make it their policy. Right. At which point they can access the cash from it. They can uh, change the beneficiary to a spouse if there is one uh, and, and all sorts of things. So it's it's not about buying life insurance for kids for life insurance sake per se. Right. I mean, we all get that. Mm-hmm. It, it's kind of it, it's, it's ghouly to even think that you would want to have a policy because if your kid dies, you want money. Nobody thinks that. But there are these yeah. other reasons mm-hmm. where it really does make sense to purchase a, a life insurance policy on like I said, from newborn all the way through when they, when, whenever you start thinking about it, because you have all of these advantages in the short term and in the long term for them. Yeah, no, that's great. I didn't realize either of those things existed or were reasons why it does, like you said, makes me feel better about thinking about it because it's, yeah, not something you want to think about, but when you've got those benefits, it's worth looking into. Yeah. Again, you don't have to look at it as if, oh my gosh, I'm buying, I want to buy life insurance. So if if my kid dies, I want some money out of it at least. I mean, no, nobody's doing that. I I remember somebody was joking. um, I was at a continuing education conference on life insurance actually. And the presenter was talking uh, about not this issue specifically, but just why people buy life insurance. And what one of them was saying, everyone was kind of laughing because it was, it's, it was, it was awful is that some people are like, well, they're my retirement, you know, with that, I expect to be able to retire for them to support me. So if they die, I need to have money because that's going to replace the income that I expect them to have provided for me. And it, I get goosebumps. It was kind of cringeworthy. Um, yeah. But you can sort of see at the same time, you know, I mean, if, if you haven't planned yeah. and you don't have a savings and you're one of those people that feels like, well, uh, you know, I took care of you growing up. You take care of me as I get older. Then, you know, you can make a case for that as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. But, but that borders on the ghoulish. So so. Absolutely. Bit, yeah, a little bit, but I can see the I can see the perspective. I can see that. But uh, a, little, a little ghoulish, but. A little, a little bit cool. Well, you know, it, not if it's later in life, but then we're not talking about kids, right? I mean, if yeah. a, if a if an adult buys a policy, you know, uh, an older um, individual buys a policy on their forty year old child because they need them to support them, they are supporting them. Totally different feel at that point, right? But for someone to do oh, that yeah. when their kid yeah. is five or six, that's uh, that's the long game, man. You know, <laughs> that's not yeah. the way I want to be planning <laughs> to my retirement based on being sure my kids support me, yeah. but uh, uh, it, it, it's a great question and you should definitely look into it. There are a handful of of companies that actually specialize in life insurance for children uh, and you can find them online. There's a handful of really good ones. Uh, I would not go with just a generic company, you know, that you would get a policy for you or me. Um, look for something specifically <laughs> tailored for kids. There are actually life insurance policies that are um, designed specifically to be college savings accounts, right? Uh, They don't take the place of a 529 plan, which you definitely want to fund, 
but it's another in, you know another aspect that you'd be able to to utilize it for. But I guess the point is there are specific products to do some of the things that we've talked about. Great, thank you. I'll have to take a look. Okay, terrific. Thanks so much for calling. Yeah, thanks. All right. Yeah, you know it, it's life insurance on kids. It, it, it's uh, it's a tough one. It just is because again, when we think about life insurance, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about the kid not being around, which is un- unimaginable, uh, just totally unimaginable. So uh, I, w- I was just going to get us back to our conversation, but we have another call in that I'd love to take first. Uh, Javon, thanks for calling in. You're on with Carl Sussman and the Insurance Hour. How can I help you today? How are you doing, Mr. Sussman? I want to ask you a question about life insurance. So I have a, will, a living will with my lawyer. So I was wondering if I die, do I need life insurance or would that cover my son? with the living will. So if I understand, so you have a will that's, that's set up to handle your assets and, and uh, I, and presumably it's going to be directed to your child. Yes. Okay. Do I need life insurance to cover me on top of that or? Well, it depends on your, on, on your personal, you know, desires, you know, the, the will, you know, the way you're describing it is basically going to say, okay, my son gets my, everything, right? My car, my house, my bank account, whatever you might have is being left. You know, a will is a a very generic um, type of uh, document to transfer, to basically tell the the, the courts that, and the government that we want to move these assets from me to them. Uh, And there's tax ramifications and all sorts of other implications. What life insurance would do is simply give you more asset to pass down to your child. So if you're saying to yourself, you know what? Uh, I don't have a ton of money. Uh, I've got, I'm, you know, I, I'm not in a bad place, but I would love for my kid to have more, right? Starting out than less. Oh, cool. Then sure, you buy a life insurance policy and you have it so that when uh, when the time comes and you're not around, the the will will just will dictate that um, the money that comes from that life insurance policy also goes to your child. So you're basically utilizing life insurance as a tool to be able to increase what you have to leave to your child. Wow, okay. And also with the life insurance, is there certain um, amounts you pay per month for increase? Or can you, you know, increase? it depends on the type of policy you purchase. Uh, you can purchase mm-hmm. policies um, that have a fixed premium uh, for a period of time, meaning that the price that you pay every month doesn't change. Uh, all the way to yeah. you, there are policies that you can pay uh, that, may increase every few years or may not. There are even policies that you can pay with a single premium if you want. Uh, it just depends. Anything and everything in between. The, the best thing to do uh, is check with the, a, a good broker that has access to a lot of different life insurance companies and just tell them, say, hey, look, I want to leave money to my kid. Uh, this is my budget. You tell me what are some of the better products that are out there that will be able to do that for me at the best price. And a good broker will do that. They'll have access to dozens of different life insurance companies and they will go and check and see which price and which product seems to work best for you. So it's better to have the life insurance also for when you get buried, right? Right, right. We yeah, talked about, yeah, I, I just mentioned final expenses. Yeah, I mean, it's not cheap. It's not cheap, you know, whether, you know, depending on what people decide they want to have done, whether they want burial or cremation or, or whatever the case may be, uh, it's not inexpensive, right? We, we're talking, right. I don't think you can get away with anything under a you know, couple thousand dollars, depending on where you are. And, and it goes just skyrockets right. from there. So yeah, I mean, there are policies that are designed specifically for that. They're called final expense policies and they tend to be the least expensive uh, and they're a fixed amount and they are a fixed amount, meaning a fixed death benefit, right? It might be $10,000 and it'll be $10,000 you know, from the beginning to the end. And the premium will be the gotcha. same from the beginning to the end. So if you're concerned or you're thinking you want to be sure that you have a policy that's going to cover a specific final expense, then they actually have products designed to do just that. So then, you know, you go to a broker and you say, hey, I'm looking to get a policy to cover my final expense, you know, my burial, my cremation, my, you know, uh, sometimes people want to throw a party. Uh, and uh, they'll, they'll say, okay, I want, I want two grand to be allocated for this. I want, you know, five grand for the cremation and the balance. I want, you know, 
X, Y, Z people to get it checked and they have to, but they have to use it to go have a party. You know, I mean, you can do whatever you want with it. So there are lots of options. Um, but to answer your initial question, a will is simply a directive, right? It, um, yeah, not giving legal advice, but in, in general terms, it provides instructions on what you want done when you're gone. And a life insurance policy just becomes one more of those things that it would basically have to decide. It would have to do, uh, have descript- descriptions on, on what to do with when you're gone. Thank you. They answered my question. I pretty appreciate you. Okay. Thank you for calling in. Appreciate it. All right. Have a good day. You Bye-bye. too. Lots of great calls today. Remember, you can always call in at 559-656-0317. If you're watching live, I'll get you right now. If not, you'll get a voicemail, and I will answer your question as soon as uh, we we come back live. Or if it's something more time sensitive, you can let me know, and I'm happy to email you back as well. You know, my goal is to help you understand insurance. And uh, if you need to have a little bit of back and forth or a little bit of conversation about it, then I'm, I'm all I'm all for it. Although it is a lot of fun to do it live because chances are, if you have the question, other people are going to have the question as well. So once again, it's 559-656-0317, or you can email anytime at questions at insurancehour.com. All right. So we were talking about uh, different types of life insurance and different reasons why and, and things of that nature. So I'm going to give you basically two large categories of life insurance. And for the most part, there's always exceptions, right? For the most part, you're going to be able to take all types of life insurance and you're going to be able to divide them into one of two categories, right? It's like um, Harry Potter times. It's are you a Gryffindor or a Slytherin? It's going to be one of those two. And one, I and, and these are generic terms. These are not insurance or specific terms. I call them temporary life insurance policies or permanent life insurance policies, And the two of them mean exactly what you think, right? One is going to be temporary. It's only going to be in place and active and pay a death benefit for a specified period of time. And then the policy ends. And then the permanent policies, as the name would suggest, are going to be around. And I jokingly say they expire after you do or not before you do. That's the general idea. So let's talk a little bit about the first category first, right? Which is term life insurance. That's the most well-known temporary life insurance. So what does term insurance mean? Term life insurance will pay a death benefit during the period of time that the policy is in effect. Now, like our earlier caller had asked, um, does the premium go up? With term insurance, the whole point of the policy is You pick a period of time, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and you say, I want to have this much of a death benefit for that period of time. What's it going to cost me? And then all of the different insurance companies have their own product, and you'll pick and choose depending on a number of factors, and you'll be given a premium. And the premium will not change during that period of time, and the death benefit will not change during that period of time, and you will have that policy. So term insurance is there for a finite, very specific period of time. The death benefit doesn't increase. The death benefit doesn't decrease. The premium doesn't increase. The premium doesn't decrease. So it's, again, very fixed, very rigid, not a lot of options. The main question that I get about term insurance is, okay, so I've been paying this for 30 years and I haven't died, as if they're upset, but what happens to all my money at the end of the 30 years? And the answer is, it's gone, right? I mean, you haven't used the policy, but you've had the coverage and you've paid for it while you had it. Sometimes people will refer to it as renting, right? You're renting life insurance. As long as you pay the rent, you're able to stay there, but you don't own the place, right? You don't have anything. You stop paying the rent, you're out of there. So term insurance is basically pay to play. While you're paying, you have coverage. If you stop paying, coverage stops. Now, there is one, there's always exceptions in insurance. Have I I said that today? Probably not. I don't say it enough. There are no absolutes. So with term insurance, there are policies that are called ROP term policies, which stands for return of premium policies. Very clever. Insurance companies are very clever with their names. ROP term insurance. So, and it does exactly what you would think. It will take all of the money that you've paid in over that term 
at the end of the term and it will give it back to you. Sounds pretty cool. Why wouldn't everybody do that? Well, as you can imagine, the cost for buying a straight term policy is significantly less than buying a policy that's a return of premium at the end of the term. And that makes sense, right? In one way, the insurance company only has an exposure in the event you die during the term. With the return of premium policy, they know they either have to pay a death benefit if you die, or they have to be prepared to pay all of that premium back to you at the end of the term. What's the difference in price? It varies, but in general, you could be looking at a 20 to 30% increase in premium. So it's not trivial. It's, it's a significant amount of money that you're paying to be able to have that money come back. And then, of course, you get into the whole financial argument. Well, with the difference between that money, couldn't I make more money somewhere else? All of that. Sometimes people will buy return of premium term insurance because it's just, it's simple, right? They're like, okay, you know what? This is just one more thing I know that at the end of the day, uh, in 20 years and 30 years, I know I'm going to get a check for X number of dollars. Cool. You know, and they're paying for life insurance and, and they don't want to get into the permanent life insurance and all of the, uh, the, the different options that come with that. So those are the two main types of term insurance. Um, I didn't mention annual renewable term, which is, as it suggests, every year the premium goes up. Basically, what the insurance company is doing is they're looking at your age. They're figuring out actuarially your likelihood of dying. They have a premium and you're paying for it. It's not very common for people to buy those policies. Yes, they are the least expensive term policy, which makes sense because the insurance company can change the premium every single year as you get older. It's usually for a very specific reason. Maybe somebody has a loan and the loan is for a year and the person loaning the money says, you know what, I want life insurance. What if you kick the bucket while I'm gone? You know, while, while you still owe me the money, I wanna have that money. So that's, that's not used very often, but you should know it exists. The other type of insurance, and we're gonna get just, we're not even gonna scratch the surface. We're gonna point at the surface because there's so much that you could get into with permanent life insurance policies. I'm just going to tell you about four primary types of permanent life insurance. The first one, and you've probably heard it before, is whole life insurance. The second kind is universal life insurance. A third kind is index universal life insurance. And a fourth kind is variable universal life insurance, okay? Now, I'm just going to give you, again, we're not even scratching the surface. We're just looking and pointing, just so you're familiar with the general idea of what they do. So first of all, what do they all have in common? Permanent life insurance policies are designed to stay in force until you die. Now notice I say designed because depending on the product or how you pay for it or what options you pick, they might not, but they're designed to do that. So if you follow the instructions, right, if you plan properly with those products, then you should be fine. So the first one is whole life insurance and the whole life insurance has been around forever. Uh, at least it feels like forever. Long before me, how's that? That's forever. That policy is what's called, it's the most rigid. There's a death benefit, there's a premium, and those two things remain the same. Now, there are some whole life policies that are also building cash value. Now, what the heck does that mean? That means that in addition to the death benefit, there is cash accumulating in the policy. Now, where is that cash coming from? It didn't just start raining cash. Well, basically, part of your premium is paying to have the death benefit, and part of that premium is going into some form of an investment account. The, the uh, cash value is something that you can take out while you're alive if you want. It's called a loan. I don't want to go further than that. Just understand that with whole life insurance, there's a death benefit and there's cash value. The next type is universal life insurance. Universal life insurance Kind of, it came out back when interest rates were crazy high, uh, like in the 80s. I know, I was a baby back then. And there was a way to try and find a way to get people to purchase life insurance as some type of an investment product. So Universal Life Insurance came out and said, hey, instead of giving a fixed pr a percentage of growth in your cash, we're going to make it variable depending on interest rates, which, cool, right? If interest rates go up, your cash value grows higher. When they go down, not so much, right? 
Mm-hmm. So that is, that's the general idea of why universal life insurance exists. It, it's to try and make the universal, the, the cash value more appealing. The next type is index universal life insurance. And an index universal life insurance policy is similar to what it sounds like. You take your cash value and the company will invest it in an index fund, right? The Dow, the the NASDAQ, depending on what it does, that's what your cash value will do. It goes up, goes down, super cool. And finally, there's variable universal life insurance, which does the same idea as index universal life insurance, except instead of investing in an index, it will invest in stocks, right? It will invest in mutual funds. It will invest in different financial investment instruments. So those are the main categories of permanent life insurance. There are so many options and they are, and they are so, I say complicated, but they can be. It's very important that you find someone that really understands how this works, right? And has access to lots of companies and has the ability to really sit down and explain these things to you. Because this is not like buying car insurance where every six months you can just decide to change it. If you make a commitment to a permanent life insurance policy, that's a commitment, right? And you're probably going to have that for a long, long time. So you want to choose wisely. So that is about all the time we have for today. And hopefully you learned a little bit about life insurance or a lot Uh, feel free to reach out anytime. If you have questions again, 559-656-0317 or questions at insurancehour.com. Thank you so much again. We'll see you next week. I do want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen today. I know insurance is not necessarily the most sexy concept. It's not the most exciting thing in the world. It is important that you understand what it is you're getting, what you should be looking for, red flags, you name it. You just need to know more than you used to. Things are more complicated than they used to be. If you have any questions, please reach out to me directly. You can email your questions to questions at insurancehour.com or call and leave a voicemail at 559 656-0317. Educating and entertaining Californians one insurance policy at a time. This is Insurance Hour. This show is dedicated to Shamrock Papa.